Hello and welcome to The Writing Coach. On this show, I speak with the instructors, editors, coaches, and mentors who help writers and authors create their art, build their audience, and sell their work. In this episode, I'm speaking with author Michelle Cornish. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I looked it up. The last time you were on the show, it was October 2018. So like years ago. It's crazy. It is crazy. It doesn't seem like that long ago. Yeah. Well, the pandemic has created this feeling of like two lost years, right? Like it feels like it's 2019. It feels like you were on the show a year ago. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, at that time, we talked about your first book about murder audit and, you know, writing it, getting it out into the world. But since that time, you've published several more books. So bring the listeners up to speed here on everything you've been writing and publishing over the last couple of years. Yeah, well, I continued on with the books um, in the Murder Audit series, so with the Cynthia Weber books, so more in the thriller genre. And then I was also just feeling like I really wanted to write something light and fun, so I attempted to write some chiclet that um, hopefully has a, a rom-com feel to it as well. Um, and a lot of that actually happened um, about a year ago, so in the pandemic, during the pandemic, I was teaching face-to-face -face at college and that wasn't possible, of course, with the pandemic happening. Uh, so I just decided to take the opportunity and write as much as I could. And I challenged myself by setting up a bunch of pre-orders on Amazon. I think I had six of them set up, <laughs> which I have to say I would do differently going forward now, but I, I, I just finished the last one a couple weeks ago. So now no more pre-orders without having the files complete is that is my advice to everyone. But anyways, <laughs> uh, it was a lot of pressure for me, but it also really challenged me to get a lot of writing done. So that was really great. Oh, okay. Let's, so let's explain this to people, this technique. So basically what happened was you posted on Amazon that you were going to publish six books and started yes, so pre-ordering them before they were written. Exactly. Yeah. So I had covers for all these books and I knew what they were going to be about so that I could do, I could write um, book descriptions for them. And so I just decided, well, why don't I just put them up there, see if I get any pre-orders on them. And it also will force me to actually write the books. <laughs> uh, so that's what I did. So one of them was um, one of the Cynthia Weber books and then all four in the rom-com series that I was doing. And um, yeah, I just thought, okay, let's do this and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That is so ambitious. It sounds maybe, though, too ambitious. See <laughs> lessons learned here? What was... Absolutely. So that that is what I learned from the process. Is, is So all I will say all of the books are more like novellas than novels. So they're on the shorter side, like 35,000 to 40,000 words. Um, and I think if I was going for longer books, there's no way I would have been able to complete them all. And of course... Um, so Amazon punishes you if you miss your pre-order deadline, right? And with the first book, I didn't realize that they go by, um, I can't remember the exact term for the time, but in essentially England time, and I was thinking it was local time. So I actually did miss my deadline for the first one and it got canceled. Oh no! Um, yeah, that was awful. Thankfully though, there was only a few people that had pre-ordered it. I still felt horrible about it, but um so big lesson learned there to be careful of my time zones and watch the ticking clock on Amazon. <laughs> so Michelle, did you literally leave it to like the minute to hit publish? Yes. So I was just wanting everything to be perfect. I was like checking for last minute typos okay, okay. and everything. And I thought, oh, I have lots of time. I thought I had until midnight Pacific time, but actually I only had until five o'clock Pacific time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so look at actually. I was ready to upload it at 10 after five. And I was like, oh, if I had only known, I could have done it before the deadline. Well, even yeah. if with the rest of this conversation is totally bland, we've already shared a helpful tip for <laughs> authors out there. It's England time, people. Yes, be very careful about the pre-order deadline. So thankfully, Amazon didn't revoke all my pre-order privileges because I, I guess they can actually do that when you have a pre-order that's canceled and you don't provide the file in time. They can actually just remove future pre-order privileges for, I believe it's a year. 
So thankfully they allowed me to continue with the existing pre-orders that I had already set up. Um, but yeah, I think my overall lesson for me anyways, is it will work better if I don't set up the pre-order until I have the final file ready to go. Um, because I actually did that um, earlier, this, earlier this year, I had a file ready to go. And I thought, well, I'll just set up a pre-order and, and it actually helped me to promote it. I felt a little more relaxed promoting the book, having it on pre-order rather than saying, oh, it's release day and promoting that way. I did the promotion from the pre-order and, and it felt a little more comfortable for me. Of course, everyone has their own thing. It's funny. I work with so many authors and I would say like maybe 75% of the time they come to me wanting to write a series. Everyone wants to write a series. No one wants to work on a standalone book or, you know, it's limited to the number of people. And what I found was like everyone else, I started out with a trilogy saying I was going to write this trilogy. And after two books in the Page Turners trilogy, I was like, oh, I want to write something else. And that's how M School came about. Like the Page Turners is third person. M School is first person. Page Turners is about boys. M School is about girls. Page Turners has magic. M School has, I was just like, I want to do something completely different. So it doesn't really surprise me that you said you wanted to branch out and try some chiclet. So, was it the same thing for you after a couple of Cynthia Weber books? Were you ready just to try something else artistically? Yes, definitely. And I'm still actually struggling with that right now because I had always from the beginning, I don't know why, but for some reason it was always going to be six Cynthia Weber books. And so I've done four and now I'm, I've, I've started drafting the fifth one. But I'm just not sure that's the book I should be working right now. Like, I don't know, something just feels off <laughs> uh, and yeah it's been really fun to try different things i know there's lots of advice out there about you know sticking to your genre and not genre hopping because i didn't create a pen name for that um i just decided you know i'm just gonna try it and see what happens it's really uh, publishing and writing books is a big experiment for me anyway so i thought you know what i'm just gonna see what happens and it's funny that you mentioned magic because that is actually something I've been wanting to write in my books as well. And so I have like, there's a chiclet series with magic that I want to write. There's, um, you know, coming of age story with magic that I want to write. And so, yeah, it's, it's sort of hard to pick what's the best book that I should be writing right now because I want to try all those different things. Oh, excuse the dogs in the background. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely, it's hard to it's hard to know uh, where to go, and yeah, I just want to I just want to try different things. And actually, I can't remember who it was. It might have been uh, John Matthew Fox that said, "Writing in different genres, and now they're gonna all start howling." Oh my goodness, is there is there something going on there? <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Well, maybe while you're muted, something I'll say is, you know, the advice is to really pick a genre and stick with it. But I've ignored that as well. I mean, I, I've published M School, which has like blood all over the cover. And then I also published Rocket Princess, which is a children's picture book. Um, I just want to create a variety of art and keep myself interested and... Um, yeah, I mean, if readers follow me from one genre to another, great. But if not, uh, that's all right, too. You know, I, I'm more interested in telling stories that interest me as opposed. I mean, I guess it's different if you have a giant ravenous fan base. Like if you're George R. R. Martin and people are like going to set your house on fire if you don't write the next Game of Thrones book. But like we're not George R. R. Martin. Why not, you know, spread your wings a bit? Yeah, and that's actually part of it too. So I find with the Cynthia Weber books, they they um they're just not popular, and that's part of it too. Is I don't have fans that are like, when's the next Cynthia Weber book coming? So then I'm like, well, maybe people don't want to read the next Cynthia Weber book. Um, so that's part of it as well as just trying to figure out, well, you know, what do I want to write, and and but still keep readers happy. Of course, I still want to sell books, but. Um, so yeah, I was gonna say, I think it was John Matthew Fox that said that writing in different genres actually helps to improve your writing overall. And I actually found that, like I just, and I find that I'm more excited like when I switch to, you know, the rom-com for a little while, I'm more excited to go back to the thriller because it's just a change and I'm a person that gets bored really easily. So it's fun for me to jump around and try different things. For sure, and I mean, you said, 
the Cynthia Weber series isn't huge. And yet, when I looked it up, you've got a ton of reviews, very positive reviews on that first book. Was that something you were focused on and making sure you got a lot of reviews? Not so much focused on the reviews, but I did do some promotion. So it was free for a while. So I was trying the um, strategy of having the first book in the series free, hoping to get read through, which I find I did have a few people. Like I feel like the Cynthia Weber series is maybe just a little too niched being about, you know, an accountant as the protagonist. You don't see that very often. So it's just a specific group of readers that maybe want to continue on to the next books in the series. Um, and also, so with Murder Audit, there's a, quite a good hook there into book two. So at the end, um, you know, it's it's not really a cliffhanger, but it gives a good intro into the next book that people might want to see, oh, what's going to happen in Auditing Jane Doe, which is book two. But then from book two to three, there's not so much, there is a bit of a, like a hint of what's coming in book three, but not such a huge hook as in book one to book two. So I do find that the read through is kind of, you know, it's not, a lot of people don't want to read the next one, but I think I have so many reviews on Murder Audit just because it was free for a while. And I, I got thousands of downloads when I was promoting it on, um, I think it was Free Booksy that I had done that time. So I actually did two different um, promotions on it through Free Booksy. And the first one was the most successful. I had, I think it was about 3,500 downloads. So, so when you think of that and then compare the number of reviews, it, the reviews don't seem as high compared to the number of people that downloaded the book. Um, but yeah, I think having the free, the free book helped to promote that book for sure. Um, but it just didn't have the read through results that I was hoping for. Well, getting those reviews, I mean, those numbers, um, seem fine to me. I, from my experience, it's like maybe five to 10% people who buy and read a book or even free download it, um, leave a review. I mean, it's, if that, you know, it's, it's shockingly hard sometimes to get those reviews. You can see people buying, see people downloading, see people enjoying it. You're getting feedback, but just taking the time to go on Amazon and leave a review. Uh, not everyone does that. And some of the people who do do it, they're like, professional Amazon reviewers, you're, you're like, oh, this guy really enjoyed my book. I wonder what else. And you click on it and he's like reviewing soap and like razors and like these people like live to review things on Amazon. Yeah. yeah and actually, so I think uh, last time I checked there, I had 60 something reviews, but they're actually, when you click on it, those are ratings. So I don't have as many written reviews. I think I, only, oh, okay. I, it's I think like have maybe reviews. like 10 or less written reviews. But lo like lots of people will just give a star after they read it. And actually, the other thing that happened is when I made that one into an audiobook, some of the audio listeners actually went and reviewed the audiobook. I think there's two audio listeners that have reviewed the audiobook, which was really nice and unexpected. Um, but the, the site where I was promoting the audiobook, they actually um, they suggest that people redu review when they grab the book because, again, it's a free download for them. So they say it would be nice if you could leave a review, which that takes the onus off of me <laughs> asking for reviews because I just don't like doing that. Okay, well, you have set up the perfect segue into our audiobook discussion. I don't know, were you planning that? Was that, were you, you like kind of throwing me the ball? Take it, Kevin, run with it. No, oh, no, that just popped into my head. That was just, that's exactly what happened with that book. So. <laughs> well, this is one of the reasons I wanted to get you back on the show. Obviously, I always love talking to you, but I saw on YouTube, you were posting some little clips from your audiobooks, and I'm a huge fan of audiobooks. Uh, I used to have a long commute to my government job. I'd be in the car 20 hours a week. And I'm like, how do I turn 20 hours of driving time into productive time? And one of the ways was audiobooks. And, and I got so deep into them. So I'm a huge fan of them, really love them. Um, but I've never actually gone down that path with my own books. I, I, I don't know why i guess i'm just so focused on my coaching business and whatnot i suspect if i was really focused on my author business i i would have jumped onto that that boat sooner um but anyway i was like okay i gotta get michelle on i gotta hear what this process is like so tell me first off have you always been a fan of audiobooks have you listened to them yourself before starting to turn your own books into them i did so 
I, I was never really an audiobook listener until similar to you, I had a commute and I was, I was wanting to read more, but you know, obviously the, the drive, you can't read a book on the drive when you're the person driving. Uh, so that's why I started listening to audiobooks is just to listen in the car after I would drop my kids off. Um, they were going to school in a different city where we live. So I had the commute in the morning and then in the afternoon. And I was finding I was getting a lot of listening in. And then I would start listening while doing the dishes as well. And and um, I just thought, so I was listening to mostly self-help help books to start with. And I thought, oh, maybe I should turn Keep More Money into an audio book because it's sort of a business, uh, you know, self-help book as well. And so that was the book that I started with thinking that, you know, I enjoy listening to these self-help books. Maybe people will enjoy listening to Keep More Money in audio. So that's... So for for uh, listeners, that's Keep More Money is your first book, and it was a nonfiction book about how to find a accountant if you're a small business, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Just want people to know, oh, no, that's know about totally your book. <laughs> totally fine. Um, so yeah, so I started with that one, and the process was really easy. I went through ACX, so um, they do have options on ACX that you can do uh, like royalty share or you can pay your narrator outright if you want to be able to publish the book on other platforms. So because I had a limited budget for me, that was not even a decision to make. I knew I was just going to do royalty share upfront because I didn't have the budget to pay the narrator so and, and they they have helpful things on the acx site as well so they they give you like a ballpark of the range of if you were to pay that narrator outright what it would be and i think at the time that i checked into it it was you know roughly two to three hundred dollars per finished hour of the book and so for me that i knew that was out of my budget so i just decided to go with the royalty share um and so once you, you start the process by claiming your book, so ACX is linked to Amazon. So you can search for your book in there, um, in the ACX database. So ACX is like ACX.com or something. It's its own website, but it's a subsidiary of Amazon. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So you actually, when you log into ACX as an author, you actually use your Amazon password to log in. Yeah. And then everything is linked up to Amazon. Um, and so once you claim your book, then you can start the process of searching for a narrator. And um, yeah, it, it walks you through, it gives you tips along the way. So it even tells you like, okay, for example, if you're wanting a fiction book narrated, the best passage to pick, like if you have multiple characters in a passage and you want to see the narrator's range and if it's going to suit your book, then they recommend that you choose a passage that you want to, you know, sort of test the narrator out. Um, so for Keep More Money, because it was nonfiction, it, it didn't, for me, it didn't really matter. So I just used the first part of the book as the script that I wanted them to read. Um, I think they recommend uh, roughly five pages to, to upload for the narrator to test out. And um, you have the option, like if you know a narrator ahead of time and you know they're on ACX, you can actually just search for them and request um, that they narrate your book. and issue an offer, offer through the platform to them. Um, but I didn't, at that time, I knew nothing about audiobooks at all. So I just asked for auditions. Um, and then you essentially wait. So once you have your script uploaded and you put in details like how long your book is, if you want the reader to be Canadian, British, American, like you can put in all these specific specifications, male, female, etc. Um, and then you just wait to get auditions and you get a, a message sent to your email when you have somebody that has done an audition on ACX and you can go and listen to it. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a really, I had a lot of fun doing it and all I've worked with uh, five different narrators now and all of them have been really great to work with and I had a great experience with them. So it's always fun asking for auditions because you never know what you're going to get and then just listening to everybody. It, it's just really fun. I just had that exact thought because I know for me, one of the funnest parts of writing and publishing a book is when you're waiting for your cover designer to send you a couple ideas, you know? And it's like, there's nothing cooler than just like, oh my God, is this what my book's gonna look like? And so I imagine waiting to hear the auditions is probably a really similar experience. Yeah, yeah, because you it says, 
the person's name, like when you get the email, it says so and so left an audition for your book, and then you can click on click through, and and so you see the name. It's like, oh, I wonder what this person sounds like, and it's just so fun, you know, having to listen. And I mean, you do get all kinds of um, quality, I guess. So sometimes you click on someone, and it's really hard to hear them. So you know that. Well, that person, maybe they don't have the right production equipment or whatever it is, but obviously you don't want somebody that's so quiet reading your audiobook because you want the best quality out there. And there is also actually um, a quality review. So once your book is completed and you approve it, then ACX does their own quality review before they will publish it through to whatever platforms you have chosen. So in terms of platforms, obviously there's Audible. Is there other platforms that, that yeah so might... if you go with the exclusive distribution it's um, audible acx and itunes so um the exclusive distribution you split your 40 percent royalty so the, um the author gets 20 percent and the narrator gets 20 percent and then there's also you can choose to do wide distribution where you can then take your files and put them on any site you want and if you're doing royalty share for that, then you split 20%. So you essentially get half of the royalties if you do the non-exclusive route. And then you can also do the pay, like I was mentioning earlier, the pay per finish hour rate, which would allow you to take the book and upload it wherever you wanted to after. Okay, so in terms of, say you go with the exclusive one, like the iTunes, uh, Audible, and what was the other one? ACX, so the actual platform where you do the recording, you can um, buy books on there as well. Okay, so say I, I choose that option. Do I then like manually upload the audiobook to each platform, or does ACX kind no, of do that? For no, me, that's or? all done through ACX. So you you actually choose it up front. So after you decide on the narrator that you want to work with, you do what's called making an offer. So that's when you choose if you're going to do the royalty split, if you're going to do it exclusive, non-exclusive, or if you're going to pay per finished hour. And so once once you choose those options, then ACX has it in their system. So for example, I've always done the exclusive route. Um, and so then they just automatically upload the book once they've approved it through their quality review process. I think if you were to choose non-exclusive, then you would have to then take the book and upload it to different platforms. So for example, if you wanted to have it on Chirp, you'd have to take your files yourself and then upload them and put it on that website yourself. But I haven't tried that route. I do hope to do that route eventually. I'm hoping that I'll have some budget that I can try that out. Um, but yeah, I'm not too sure how that works. So when you're looking for narrators to audition is it like you're posting the project and then they're finding it or are you sorting through narrators and kind of choosing who you want to audition you can actually do it both ways okay um so for the books that i'm working on right now um the rom-com ones there's just four books in the series and so far i've had the same narrator for the first two and I'm hoping that she'll be willing to do the next two as well. So in that case, because I knew that I wanted to work with her for the second book, all I did was just search for her. And actually ACX makes it really easy if you've worked with a narrator previously, it kind of includes it in a drop down list. So you can just choose their name and make an offer right away. So you don't, even though I still have to upload the um, sample narration that I wanted her to do, she didn't actually have to go through and audition because I was just making her the offer right away up front. But you can also have it. So if you don't know who you want to work with, then you request auditions and that's when they will send you messages when you have people audition. I have to say there was one book where it seemed to take forever to get auditions. And I was like, oh no, nobody wants to read this book for me. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> but I did finally get some auditions that were really good. So that was awesome. <laughs> so when you're listening to auditions, what type of things are you looking for? I mean, you've already said, you know, quality is obviously, you know, professional sounding quality. But if you have a bunch of people who all are voice people and have good equipment, and sound good, how do you choose one over the other? Are you going with gut instinct or what are you going for? Yeah, I think it is a lot of gut instinct, but um, I also listen to how they differentiate characters. So mm -hmm. with the novels, I make sure that I have passages where it has more than one character talking, and I try to also include male and female voices. Um, so for example, for the Cynthia Weber books, because 
Cynthia Weber is female, I decided I want to have a female narrator, but I also want to see how the narrators do with male voices. So I made sure that my passage included both male and female characters in there. Um, so that was part of what I was listening to. Um, sometimes I have like, um, you know, like bang or, you know, things like that. And then I want to see how they narrate those kinds of words as well. Yeah. I know, especially as an independent author, I mean, it's in the title, independent or self-publishing. It's like, it can be a lonely process. And I always look forward to that point where I'm like dealing with editors and dealing with designers. It's like, hey, I've got a team finally after however much time working on this book. Uh, this must be just like one more uh, collaborator to have as part of your book project. That must be nice to just have one more person on the team helping get your art, art out into the world. Yeah, it's so true because uh, they're also, you know, getting a portion of the royalties. So it's to their benefit to also help you promote the book, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and it is nice to be able to communicate back and forth. Uh, one of the narrators that I had, so you can actually send messages to your narr narrator directly in the ACX platform, uh, but it can be a little bit clunky sometimes. So one of the narrators that I was working with, she had given me her direct email, which was really nice because then we could just message back and forth through email and sort of avoid the whole um, ACX going back and forth in their system because they give you what happens is when you get a message in ACX, it of course goes through to your email anyway. So then you're almost getting like double messages because they're in ACX and they're also in your mm, email. Yeah. Uh, so it's really nice that she offered to do that. And then when I worked with future narrators, I was sort of doing the same thing with them because it just felt easier. And then if I had corrections, it was easier to just email them instead of asking for the corrections through ACX. When the books were completed, I assume you went back and listened to the whole books. What's it feel like hearing your own writing read back to you by someone else? Does it provide some distance kind of that lets you hear it as its own thing, not so close to you? Yeah, so and the, for the first one, for Murder Audit, there was lots of stuff that I was cringing on because, of course, I had written more books and learned more things since then. So I was like, oh, I could have said that much better. And I actually did um, ask her to change a few things that were no fault of her narration, of course. It was just that I wanted it worded a little bit differently because I didn't like how I had originally written it. So that was a little bit humbling hearing the first one. And so then after that, I made sure to go through and almost re-edit the books before I would request the narrator to do an audition. Because <laughs> of course I wanted to have them best as possible. Um, but the thing that I find um, now that I'm writing other books, especially if they're in the same series. So for Cynthia Weber, for exact, uh, example, I actually start to hear the narrator's voice in my head as I'm writing the new book, which is really weird. <laughs> but it, it almost helps me to feel like, okay, how would this be said out loud? Like as I'm writing it, it almost just helps me to get a better feel like, okay, how would this narrator say it? Oh, I need to write it like this instead. So it, I, yeah, I, I, it's been really fun. It, it, it was weird at first, but now I, I really like hearing the books read and it, it doesn't, it almost doesn't feel like my book. Like once they put the character into it, cause they have their own interpretation, of course. I mean, I can always say, oh, I don't like the voice of this character. Could you please change it? But I kind of like to see how they interpret it. So it does feel like it's a little bit removed from being my book. Like it's also now their project and their creative um, ideas have gone into it as well. So yeah, that's really, it's a really fun thing to hear the finished book for sure. Well, for any authors out there hearing this and they've maybe been a little intimidated about producing an audiobook, any any lessons learned or any final tips you'd want to share with them? I would say if you're thinking about it, just go for it, especially if you're open to experimenting with the royalty share, because all it costs you is your time. Like you, you know, you don't have to put out any money up front and it's a good little test to see if you like doing audiobooks and how they sell for you. Um, and the process is really easy. I know I said earlier that with the messaging system in ACX, it's a bit clunky, but it's, it's not a big deal. The system is really friendly. It really walks you through everything. So even the first, when I did Keep More Money, the very first audiobook, like I had no idea what I was doing. And the system made it really easy to figure out. It's really user friendly. Um, and of course, the narrators too, like they've been helpful. I think 
they've been narrating books longer than I've been creating audiobooks. So that was kind of nice to have a little bit of help from them as well. <laughs> and they are um, essentially the producers of your audiobook as well. So they are, they're the ones that are responsible for passing the quality control that ACX has. Um, and so they're a really good resource to ask questions too. So yeah, I would say just go for it if, if you're you're not sure. And actually that's how I ended up doing my novels. I did the nonfiction because I had been listening to nonfiction books, but I hadn't really listened to a lot of novels in audiobook before. I do now, I, I listen to way more novels than I used to through audio. Um, but I had asked a friend of mine who just, she was just automatically putting all of her books into audio and she was mostly writing fiction. So I just asked her what she thought of it. And she said, well, I think the more options you have for people, the better, and the more chances to get your book seen by people. And that just really hit home for me, I guess. So I thought, well, why not? I'm just, I'm doing royalty share anyway, so I don't have anything to lose. So. Well, Michelle, you know, I was there at the beginning of your fiction career, and it's just been such a pleasure to watch you continue to blossom and publish and experiment and be so ambitious. And now here you are teaching me all about audiobooks. Um, I just want to congratulate you on, on watching your, your career continue in such a fantastic way over these, you know, several years that we've known each other. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. And I think you nailed it when you said experiment because that, that's that's really how i look at it as just a big experiment and trying different things and seeing what works I, almost like you know they say throwing spaghetti at the wall and they they say not to do that but i think sometimes it's just fun to do that why not <laughs> well and i think in today's world i mean even if spaghetti stuck to the wall a year ago well maybe the technology has changed now i mean our, our world is changing so quickly, you have to have an experimental mindset. Because if you did find something that worked two years ago, it's probably not working now. Exactly. And I find for me, so I've been following, you know, the successful self publishing authors and doing what they recommend and following the advice. And honestly, for me, it just hasn't really worked. So the best thing for me was to just change my mindset. And you know what, I'm just gonna experiment and see what happens. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Michelle, keep on experimenting and we'll get you back on the show. You can continue to teach me and the listeners about these different avenues for getting their stories into the world. I would love that. It's always fun talking with you, Kevin.